which heaven's joys so bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of Hello, welcome again to our study of the book of Genesis. You remember that last time we studied about the death of Sarah, the only woman in Scripture whose entire lifespan we actually know because we're given the number of years of her life. You may remember also that Abraham set out to purchase a piece of property, not so much to live on, but instead to bury his dead in. And that piece of property becomes, as it were, the first anchor or foothold, toehold, if you would, that the children of Israel will have on this particular uh, territory, Canaan, that will become the promised land. Then we went on to observe how that Abraham set out to find a wife for Isaac. He gave an assignment to a very trusted aging servant of his to go back to the land that he came from. Do not find him a wife from among the Canaanites, but instead go back and get him a wife from among my people. We saw how that that servant made that journey, that he did indeed meet up with the family of uh, Abraham, that he found Rebekah, and that Rebekah consented to be the wife of Isaac and even to leave right away without spending uh, 10 days in somewhat of a farewell party. That's how we closed out chapter 24 with Isaac going into his new bride, Rebecca, and him loving her. Now, by the time we get to chapter 25, we learn just a little bit more about Abraham, something that we may have forgotten if we've read it before, or maybe we've just never heard about it at all. But listen to what happens. And Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Ashuram, Latushim, and Lemumin. And I've got to admit, I don't pronounce all those words probably correctly. But what are we learning? Well, Abraham had more children. He had children by Keturah. Keturah is described in other places in Scripture as being the concubine of Abraham. Like, for example, in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 32, she is described that way. Before we go very far, we want to notice that that Jokshan had a son named Sheba. And you may remember later that Solomon has a visit from the queen of Sheba. How interesting that that all would tie together here, as it were, in the life of Abraham. Sheba's brother, Dedan, settled on a major oasis in northwest Arabia which became a great commercial center. Midian, of course, appears a number of times in Scripture. Sometimes you might say they're in a somewhat favorable light. Other times, not so very favorable. In fact, they fight the children of Israel, particularly in the book of Judges in chapters 6 through 8 of that book. Well, he goes on and tells a little bit further, the writer does, about... uh, Uh, the descendants of Abraham through Keturah. He says the sons of Midian were Ephah, Epher, Hanak, uh, Abida, and Elda. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. But Abraham gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had. And while he was still living, he sent them eastward, away from Isaac, his son, to the country of the east. <clears throat> Shua, by the way, was, as you may note, Keturah's sixth son, at least in the list. Uh, Job's friend Bildad 
was a Shuite. And one wonders if that gives us a little bit of an idea about, uh, about the time frame for the book of Job during the days of the patriarchs. There could be no doubt about that. But after the time of Abraham, that seems to be a pretty fair possibility. Notice that Abraham sent Keturah's sons away. He did not want anyone to jeopardize what he had done with Isaac. He had given everything to Isaac, and he wanted no challengers to that at a later date. He demonstrated through that means a trust in the promise of God that in Isaac your seed shall be called. And so Isaac inherited all the riches of Abraham. Well, then in verses 7 and 8 of Genesis chapter 25, we find the end of this great man of faith and his life. Uh, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. An old man and full of years was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him. Where were they going to bury him? Well, they've only got one burial place. So don't be surprised when it says they buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt at Beer Leheroi. So he went to the place that is designated uh, long ago, really, by Hagar as uh, being dedicated to the God who both sees and knows all about us. Well, the next thing that the text does actually uh, after, uh, after this is to, to begin to tell us, uh, having noted that God blessed Isaac, to tell us briefly a little bit more about Ishmael. Really, this is the end of what we learn about him. It explains about uh, where, who his descendants were and a little bit about uh, where they went and and uh, gives that complete uh, message in just very, very, very few verses. And then he goes back, and the writer picks up again uh, talking about Isaac. Verse 19 of Genesis 25. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. So 40 years of age before he got married. And he got married to the woman that uh, Abraham had arranged for through sending his servant, as you'll remember, back uh, to the homeland. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Somehow or other, in this great family of the faithful, you will observe that there is a problem with childbearing. Each family, each generation, seems to need to learn, at least in part, that God is responsible for the blessing of children. The singer of Israel calls them a blessing in, in Psalm 127. He says the fruit of the womb is the reward from God. And most folks would say that, although I've heard a few people say that they would more so say it about their grandchildren. But children are a blessing from God. And if you had to pray about it for 20 years before God answered the prayer, I'm sure that you and I both would agree it, children really are a blessing from God. Well, Rebecca has conceived. We've seen that. And then the text gives us an interesting report about what happened. But the children struggled together within her. And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. You know, she doesn't live with her family anymore. She does have uh, her maids to, to serve her, take care of her. But she's in her first pregnancy and she's concerned 
Uh, what is this that's going on? If everything's right, why is it like this? And she goes to the right place to find the answer to her question, doesn't she? She goes to God. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So God tells her what is going to take place in the future. He gives her insights that no one else has concerning these two that are within her womb at this time. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in the womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Esau means uh, red. Uh, He is red and hairy, a very distinctive uh, young man, no doubt about that. And interestingly enough, later, his descendants would be called Edom, indicative of the fact that they came from their red father, as it were, Esau. So he's the firstborn. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Now, he grabbed the heel. His name becomes Jacob. The name Jacob uh, can be translated and is most often translated uh, uh, as supplanter. But it means heel grabber. In other words, he grabs hold and pulls himself up and out by, by grabbing hold of his own brother's heel. And the reality is that, that a portion of Jacob's life will be like that. He, he will grab hold of somebody else and, and get his advantage, get his advancement, as it were, uh, through them. And, and we begin to see that even in his birth. Uh, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. That may be uh, a foretaste of one of the saddest statements in all of Scripture. Esau was a hunter. His dad loved him. Isaac loved him because he loved to eat the game that, that he, he found for him. And that he brought back to him. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And that disparity between the parents, that showing of favoritism to one child or the other, uh, serves, unfortunately, to be a source of conflict uh, between these two as they go along. That conflict in the womb, then, was just a foreshadowing, as it were, of what was going to happen later in their lives. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. Uh, So red, here, here we go. Why he's called Edom? Because he wants the red stew made out of lentils, uh, Somewhat a type of bean, I guess you and I would probably say. It's at least in that same basic family as I understand it. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. Remember, Esau's the firstborn. Certain things go with being the firstborn. And Jacob says, you can have the stew if you'll sell me the birthright. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. It seems to me that the despising was more than just the selling. It was the fact that he could could sell it sit down and eat the meal and get up and walk away and not say another word about it. It just doesn't seem to matter to him. The writer of Hebrews 
picks up this story as well in Hebrews chapter 12. And he tells us a little bit more about what is going on here. Something that we need to see and beware of lest we have it in our own lives. Listen to him in verse 16 as he's writing in chapter 12 of Hebrews, giving a warning to the children of God in the church. Let there, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Profane is a person that's not religious, not pious, not reverent before God. For you, want, for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. And we're going to come back to that passage, at least we'll, we'll reference it later, because it talks about something that is yet future as we are reading in the book of Genesis. But notice, he was profane. He did not really have proper respect for God when he sold his birthright. And you might say, well, how could that be? Well, the reality is that in this family, uh, the blessing that was given to Abraham uh, should ordinarily go with the birthright. And so... Uh, we have Esau basically despising, despising what he has in the birthright. And that is where the real problem comes about uh, with him. He has no concern at all for this. Later in the book of Malachi, maybe it's for that reason that we find God saying through his prophet, I have loved Jacob but Esau I have hated. It's not because he, he hated Esau as Esau. He hated the actions of Esau. Those actions that showed a disrespect for God were detrimental to his relationship to God. And so for that reason, God could not put him in the forefront and did not put him in the forefront, but instead put Jacob in that position. So the birthright has been sold. And Esau despised it, didn't seem to show any regard for it. Chapter 26 of Genesis opens in a, in a way that, that sounds very familiar. Uh, out of the story of Abraham, you'll remember it. Listen to what happens. There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Now, we don't really know that this is the same Abimelech. My instincts and, and would cause me to think not likely. It may be that the name Abimelech was a name that was, that was a, given to all the kings of the Philistines in that area around Gerar. That's at least a possibility. But whatever the case may be, Isaac pursues the same course that his father did. He went to the land where Abimelech was king during a time of famine. And then we find this report in verse 2 of Genesis 26. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. In other words, don't go any further. This is as far as you need to go. Don't go to Egypt. And, and we might ask again why. I don't have the answer to that. My suspicion is it's not time yet. Later, there will be one that goes down to Egypt. And we'll talk about him. But it's not time yet for Abraham's descendants to go to Egypt. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and your seed, all the, the nations of the earth shall be blessed in your seed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. So you see, God blessed Isaac. We might ask why. Well, at this point in time, God says, I'm giving you the blessing of your father. Why? Because of him. Because of the kind of man that he was. 
Isaac would himself demonstrate that he was that kind of a man as well in his lifetime, uh, briefly, because we don't see him for very long. Uh, but, but ultimately, the promise of Abraham is now passed. It's passed from Abraham to Isaac, and we will eventually see it go forward even to the next generation. So Isaac did what? What did you expect him to do? He stays in Gerar, just like God told him to do. But Isaac had convinced Rebekah that because of her beauty, that the men of the area might want to kill him and take her for their wife. And so uh, she is asked by Isaac, say you're my sister. Now does that sound familiar? Of course it does. Because that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah had done before them. Now, over a period of time, what happened was Abimelech saw, the king saw, Isaac and Rebekah together. And I don't want to be indelicate, but let's just say that, that they were acting more like a husband and wife would act than like a brother and a sister would act. They were showing one another some affection, and Abimelech noted it. It's not the affection that a brother gives his sister, but instead the affection of a husband for a wife. And so Abimelech called Isaac in verse 9 of Genesis 26, and he said, quite obviously she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Uh, and Isaac said to him, because I, uh, I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech says, what is this you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. Even a, a king who doesn't really worship God recognizes that this is not appropriate conduct. It was deceptive and potentially very, very harmful to the people of the land. Abimelech then makes, uh, gives an instruction. He charges the people. Listen to him. As he continues, he who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. All right, Isaac has said, I told you that because I was afraid that I would be killed for my wife. Abimelech takes care of that. He says, don't touch either one of them. Anybody, don't touch them. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Boy, a hundredfold is a powerful, powerful uh, harvest in that time frame. If you read the rest of Scripture, you'll, you'll discover that, it's, that it is a, an utmost number, as it were, in that time. God blessed him in the land. And, of course, that blessing, that prosperity, was evident to all the people that were around. Uh, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father, and they had filled them with earth. Now we might ask why. Well, water was very precious in those days. But beyond that, digging a well and giving it a name effectively was claiming it as your own. And so the Philistines, in, perhaps in jealousy, certainly they were jealous of Isaac, filled up the well so that Abraham could not say that any portion of the land really was his own. Uh, so what, what is going to happen? What would you expect? There's got to be a separation. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 16 of Genesis 26. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Boy, now that was a prized possession. Most of the wells that they dug in those days were dug as a deep pit that would catch rainwater. It would serve more, more 
uh, in that way than it would in a, as a well as we normally think of it. But when they dug a well and they, and they found running water, uh, they hit the aquifer, as it were. Why, that, that was an amazing blessing uh, that God had given him. But notice verse 20. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esek, because they quarreled with him. So the first well he calls quarrel. Uh, but it, they b- dig another one. And uh, that's verse 21. But again, they quarrel. And so he names that one uh, Sitma, which is, which is basically the idea of conflict. So he's got quarrel and conflict uh, that, that we're dealing with uh, so far uh, in the naming of these, of these wells. But then they dug another well. Uh, he moved and they dug a well. And nobody quarreled over it. So guess what he named that? Rehoboth, which means spaciousness. There's there's plenty of space for me now. God has given me room to live in this land. He is he's wonderfully blessed. Well, Abimelech comes back with, with some of his uh, men. And he asks for a treaty uh, to be formed between Isaac and himself. He sees the power that God has, has given Isaac, he sees the blessings there and he wants to be sure that he's not found, as it were, in, in opposition to the one who is blessed by God. He and Isaac form that covenant on that occasion and, and when they do so, uh, then, uh, then uh, he names that place, as you might expect. He names it because of the of the agreement that they have come to, and he calls it a Sheba, or oath. So we now have Beersheba uh, that we'll hear about so much as days uh, go on by in the biblical story. So we have Isaac now becoming the one who is uh, the descendant of promise. He has received the promise of Abraham. He's been blessed, even though he, again, like Abraham, proved to be fallible, proved to be weak in, on certain occasion. Even though that happened, God blessed him. He's going, his people are going to be blessed just as God promised. And all the world will ultimately be blessed through the descendants of Isaac. We'll have to learn more about that next time. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's Still be my vision.